Welcome to Marriage Day Podcast. I'm Jimmy Evans. This is my wife, Karen, and we exist to help every single couple succeed in marriage. Mm -hmm. We want you to have the marriage for your dreams. We're talking today about the secret of lifelong love. When you get married, you don't want it to last three or four, eight years. You want it to last the rest of your lives. So we're talking about the secret of lifelong love. And Karen, uh, we're going to begin with some questions from our viewers uh, before we go to the teaching. And I want to begin with a question to you. Uh, What do I do when my husband's family disrespects me and our children? Whenever I try to discuss this with my husband, he gets really defensive and angry. It has been making a very negative impact on our marriage. (laughs) Well, we talk about this a lot in our teachings that a year in-laws which the other side cannot come in between your marriage. No. It's just wrong. No. And we like to say that it's the spouse's parents, that that spouse is the one that has to be the one that stands up and says right. the right thing. That's right. That you can't expect your, you know, your wife to take care of her in-laws. That's just wrong. And, um, you know, and so, you know, when we first got married, our parents, you know, both of us were raised in non-Christian right. homes. Right. So our parents had baggage. We had baggage. And so our upbringing was hard, and um, and so when we got married, you know, it, it, as much as we love and respect our parents, yeah, they they started trying to inf- you know come in, and I think that's normal, you know, that parents first of all probably don't trust that your marriage is going to work. They may not like your spouse, oh, sure. and so they're going to try to find a way to get in there and try to fix things or be dominant and opinionated. And um, I think that you just have to start off by saying our marriage is first. Our kids are second. Well, actually, God's first, then marriage, and then our kids, and then family and friends come right. way down here. Right. But you know, we made a rule with our kids that we we will not intrude on you. And when you want an opinion, I'll give it to you, but I'm not going to give it to you unless you want it, because we saw what it was doing to us That's in right. our marriage, the effect negatively of my parents and your parents, and they were good people, but they were doing things right. that was. Putting right. a lot of tension and a lot of uh, discord in our family. Well, let me go back to the first thing you said. You, it, you just can't take on your in-laws. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a no-win proposition. <laughs> and so this woman here, there's no way that she's going to be able to go to her in-laws and say, now, let me just tell you something right now. Now, she could do it, but it's going to start World War III. But the other thing is her husband's not supportive of that. So this husband has got to stand up and to say to his family, hey, listen, don't disrespect my wife and don't disrespect my children. Mm-hmm. And what then? Then what happens is they, he and the wife are a unit, a united front, not against his parents, but just saying we're drawing a line here. You're not going to cross this line. Now there is no line. the The way she's saying it here, there is no line. Mm-hmm. His parents can come into the relationship. They can disrespect her and the kids without any penalty. Mm-hmm. This is a divorce waiting for a place to happen. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, it sounds like the. Like scripturally, it just says, when a man and a woman get married, they become one. Right. And they, the husband leaves. You the leave family. and cleave. Yeah. yeah. You leave. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, and he hasn't left. Mm-hmm. Obviously, there's there's something going on there. This is you need to go get counseling. Does anybody anyone in this situation here do everything you can do to get your spouse into counseling because this is wrong? Mm-hmm. It, it's anatomically this this is going against the heart of the marriage relationship and you have to leave to cleave. Mm-hmm. There has to be a distance. You don't disrespect your parents. You don't reject your parents, but you have to put a boundary on that relationship and just say, you don't control our relationship. You don't criticize our relationship. You need to be respectful. Okay. You, you've got a question. Um, after being married for five years, I made the mistake of flirting with another guy by way of text messages. I realized that one of the reasons I fell into this was because I really wanted my husband to show me more affection and encourage me with his words. I know what I did was wrong, and now my husband has been more distant because he doesn't trust me. What can I do about the situation? Well, yeah, that's a, that's a big problem. I would recommend counseling uh, if, if, to go, at least for her. Mm-hmm. Um, but to go to counseling and get help for yourself, I wouldn't try to, I wouldn't try to crack this nut on your own. I wouldn't try to, to solve this problem on your own. Um, your husband is hurt. Now, men are less likely to forgive than their wives. Mm-hmm. And so women are more forgiving mm-hmm. in these situations. So your husband's hurt. This tracks his ego. He feel, he would feel as though that, you know, you chose another man over him. So, you know, he feels like he's a loser in that situation. So it's the old saying that trust is earned in drops and lost in buckets. Mm-hmm. So through 
these text messages in, in emotional affair, whatever you want to call it, you lost a lot of trust. So you're going to have to earn it back in drops. Now, your husband needs to forgive you, but he's only going to open up to you as you show a difference. Mm -hmm. And you talk about him being more affectionate and whatever. You also need to meet his needs. Um, rather than this relationship going into a stalemate, that someone needs to be pursuing the other and you need to be pursuing him. And I really do believe there needs to be some counseling here. What would you say? Well, I was thinking two things. The One of the things that, you know, sometimes we forget to mention on the show that's so important is prayer. I mean, the power of prayer in mm -hmm. circumstances, I've seen it. I've watched couples totally make a turnaround because we've been praying for them. Yeah. You know, and so... Start off by prayer. You know, find friends that will pray. Pray about the situation over and over, asking God to get to his heart. Because God can reach this husband's sure. heart. There's no doubt about it. Yep. And um, and then the other thing is, you know, in circumstances like this, it's, yeah, she did wrong, and yes, it needs to be forgiven. But it's that temptation that she took that bait is concerning, too. Yeah. That, like you said, she needs counseling, too. Because, you know, you and I have had this um, testimony of what happened with me, you know, in our marriage and how bad it was. And, you know, I could have been a million times because you were a jerk. You were, yeah. you know, I, I, none of my needs were getting met. Yeah. And, um, except sex. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and so, yeah, it was. And so, but, you know, the thing that I'm trying to say is, you know, I look at that situation and I think, you know, I, I had to find a way, you know, and I would never have thought about somebody else. But I made that decision way back before. And I think as a women, as women, you know, that's what I want to say to any woman listening, is don't ever let your heart go there. That's right. You know, if if you're being tempted, find a way quickly get out of it. Because that's why the the the, the prayer that we pray every day is, Lord, keep me away from evil and temptations. Right. Because every day you're gonna be tempted of something. Anger, sex, you yeah. know, looking the other way towards, towards somebody else. And so, you know, again, I just think that this can be fixed, but I think it's gonna take some counseling and some time. Yeah, and in this this kind of a situation, um, the hurt that is created through the unfaithfulness. Um, it's just going to take time. There, you just can't microwave this thing. But through prayer and through counseling and through pursuing him, mm -hmm. that's your best chance. And it can work. I mean, there are, there are tons of relationships that we've known where there has been full-blown adultery, where there, the marriage was healed. Mm -hmm. um, and there were problems on, obviously, the, the cheater side, but also the other side. Mm -hmm. And that this can be an opportunity for God to heal the relationship. <laughs> we're going to go now to the teaching on the secret of lifelong love. We hope. I want to talk to you about a, a dynamic that's very common in relationships. It's a sprint mentality versus a marathon mentality. When we, when we get married, when we meet each other, we typically are in a sprint mode rather than a marathon mode. Marriage is a marathon. My mom and dad married for 61 years. You can't sprint that long. Uh, 70 pounds ago and 50 years ago, I used to run track. And so, you know, I, when I ran track, I mean, the sprinters, you could go uh, quick for a short distance, but the marathoners had a completely different mentality. And so many people today get married in a sprint, and what they find is, is that everything's passionate, everything's wonderful, everything's incredible right before it crashes. But the marathon mentality says, it's not what we can make happen, it's what we can keep happening. What can we keep happening for 61 years? What can we keep happening for the rest of our lives rather than what can we make happen for a few months or a few years, you know, while we're falling in love and while we're securing the relationship or something like that, and then the thing falls apart. Marriage is like two rivers that come together. When you're dating, you're like parallel rivers. You're, you're adjoining each other. You're examining each other. You think you know each other, but when, you're get, when you get married... It's like two rivers that come together and there's the immediate crashing, you know, just the, the personalities, the different uh, people, the different, you know, desires, whatever you want to say, personas that come together and there's a lot of turbulence, there's a lot going on. But what happens is the longer you're married, God's way, in the marathon mentality, the more you become one, the more it becomes peaceful, it becomes joyful. And when Karen and I got married, we married in a sprint. And, and what I mean by sprint is, at 16 years old, we started dating, we fell in love, we, we had this, you know, we, we fell in love. I mean, we fell 
head over heels in love with each other. And that lasted for a year or two. And then our sprint, we, we became exhausted. I began to, you know, be mean to Karen, mistreat her. And after marriage, it was a miracle we got married in the first place. But after, you know, a couple of years of marriage, you know, we thought we'd made a mistake. I mean, and we were out of love. I mean, we were completely out of gas. So we completely understand when a person says, I'm out of love and I'm hopeless in this relationship because you get married and you want it to last. You know, you want your marriage to last. And I'm saying you absolutely can have a marriage that gets better and better and better and you can have a marriage that lasts for the rest of your life. You've got to get out of the sprint mentality and you've got to get out of the fear mentality. When you're operating in fear, it will make your fears come true. But when you're operating in faith, it will make your dreams come true. And so a lot of people, we, when Karen and I married, we were full of fear and we had a sprint mentality. And so we almost divorced. I mean, it was by the grace of God that we made it. Now, this is a very, very important question. What is the source of your love? What, when you say you love someone, what is the source of that? Now, again, most of us have never thought about this, but I want you to think about it. And when you, when you ask a person that's in love, um, they're married, they're in love, what, is, what fuels your passion for your marriage? What fuels your love for your spouse? The typical answers are passion, chemistry. We, we just have great chemistry. We're soulmates. That's kind of a big phrase today. Sexual attraction, we're best friends. We enjoy being together, you know, all the above or whatever. And so those are the answers. But life happens. Conflict, children, finances, job stress, hurts from our past, temptation and sins, mistakes, failures, hurtful words, taxes, bills, illness, in-laws, the devil, the world. All of that happens to us and it drains our batteries. I mean, all of that's going to happen. Again, the marathon mentality says we have got to run this race in such a way is that we can endure whatever's coming. The sprint, sprinters don't think like that. The, the sprinters have a completely different mentality. And a lot of people who fail in marriage, they're sprinters who don't have a resource deep enough, a lasting resource to fuel their love long term. Karen and I didn't. When we got married, I mean... Uh, you know, we got married with the best of intentions, but one day I woke up and I mean, I was out of love. I didn't love Karen anymore. And I just, if someone said, do you love your wife? I, said, I, w I wouldn't have said it probably. I would have pretended, but I didn't love Karen anymore. I thought I'd made a mistake. She was the enemy. Karen was my enemy. And here was the thought in my mind. If she would change, our marriage would be healed. If she would change, our marriage would be so much better and our marriage would be healed. And a lot of people, a lot of you watching right now, you know, wherever you're watching, is you have that thought in your mind. I, I can just tell you, I was wrong. I had a sprinter's mentality. I had a fear-based mentality. I was deceived. And I absolutely believed that I had married the wrong woman. I had made a mistake. And now I was stuck in a bad marriage. And so let me tell you the two wrong sources of love. And these are the two most common sources of love. So I'm asking you, what is your source of love? If you're going to make it in marriage, if you're going to make it for the next 61 years, like my mom and dad, you're going to make it for another 40 or 50 years. Okay. What is your source of love? Here's the most common source of love for people who get married. My spouse. My spouse is my source of love. You make me feel good. I like the way that I feel when I'm around you. you. You fill up my love tank. I'm looking for love. I'm looking for acceptance. I'm looking for a soulmate. I'm looking for a best friend. And being around you makes me feel this feeling. So Karen was my source of love. And what that means is I can't love you more than you're loving me. Now, I tell the story about when I played golf. I golfed all the time. I worked all the time. And it almost ruined our marriage. And the night that our marriage was healed, you know, I gave up golf. But let me tell you about why I played golf. Let me tell you about just the, my emotional disposition at that time. I got saved a week before we got married, so I was a Christian. But I didn't know how to trust in God. I, I didn't know that. So Karen was my source of love. I wanted Karen to meet my needs. And so when we got married, she, she couldn't. Because only God can meet your deepest needs. See, people can't meet your deepest needs. Only God can. And when you don't trust God to meet your deepest needs, you automatically transfer 
the expectation of that on your spouse and your marriage is set up for failure. It's a codependent relationship. In other words, your source is just simply the wrong source. It's not, it's not God, it's your spouse. So my source was, was Karen. Well, I need acceptance. That's one of the things I need. You know, I need identity to feel like I'm somebody. I mean, I, I have all those needs, but here's the way Karen made me feel. She made me feel rejected. Because love is our greatest need, rejection is our greatest wound and our greatest fear. My greatest need is love, true love. And my greatest rejection, or my greatest fear then, it's true for everyone. Well, so we were married, and I remember walking through the house, and I would say or do something, and what I was trying to do is to get a certain response from Karen. A smile, a look, a uh, you know, her to jump on top of me and, you know, passionately kiss me or whatever I was looking for. Well, it didn't happen. And um, it made me feel rejected. Now, I'm not the kind, most men are not this way. I'm not the kind of a person that when I feel rejected, I say, I feel so rejected. <laughs> My feelings are just so hurt. Karen, you just devastated me. You know, I didn't do that. When, when I get hurt, this is what I do. I set my jaw. I'm always telling I'm getting upset because my jaw goes out. <laughs> so I do. So Karen, I would be walking through the house and I would say, hey Karen, how are you? And she'd kind of, you know, ignore me or walk off. She just, she wasn't being bad. There's nothing wrong with her. And I would think to myself, she, she doesn't think I'm attractive. She didn't like me. I don't know what I did, but she, and I felt rejected. And I'd go get my golf clubs and go golfing. Because on the golf course, I didn't feel that way. I didn't feel that way with my friends. But when I came home, I was so raw with the feeling of rejection. Okay. Well, so Karen was my source. She made me, there's nothing wrong with her. But because she became my source, I could only love her as much as she was loving me. I felt disappointment. I felt frustration. She got pregnant. Life happened, job stress, all the kind of things that began to happen that puts pressure on both of you, regardless of how hard you're trying. And so finally, you know, I just turned my heart away from her. This is what I did. Because she was my source, I turned my heart away from her, and then I became uh, angry and verbally hostile toward her. I punished her. My way of trying to change her was very ungodly as I began to be verbally aggressive toward her and beat her down verbally, and that led us to the brink of divorce. What is, your, what is your source of love? It cannot be my spouse. If they're the best person on the planet, they cannot be my source of love. I hope you feel passion. I hope you have good chemistry. I hope you're sexually attracted to each other. I hope you're soulmates and all that. It's not enough. It cannot, it's enough for a sprint. It's enough for a sprint. We're sexually attracted. We just love each other. We're soulmates. Go, have your sprint, and then you'll fall down exhausted and your love will be over. If your source is a person, you'll fail. I promise you will fail. I promise you'll get your heart broken. I promise you'll be devastated by marriage. If you trust in yourself, you think too highly of yourself. I'm, I just can't do it. I cannot love with that kind of love. Well, what's the answer? God. The only, the only source that can fuel a lifetime of love is the person who perfectly, permanently, and powerfully loves my, my wife and myself. So when I wake up in the morning, here's, here's what I do. This is, this is Karen and me. When I woke up this morning, this is what I did. When she woke up this morning, this is what she did. And we do it every day. This is, this is our marriage. I sit before the Lord, and when I pray... And here's what I say. God, I can't love Karen today. I can't love Karen today without you. I can't. And I know life is going to happen. I know that we're going to have conversations, issues. I'm going to walk through the house and I'm going to want her to smile at me and, and tell me what a hunk I am and jump on top of me. And, and it's not going to happen. And when, and when that happens, I need the grace not to call her something bad. I need the grace not to take it personally. I always took it so personally. And Karen was just walking through the house thinking about a thousand things and she'd give me a look. Well, she was, 
She was stressed out about all the things she had to do, but I took that personally. Lord, I need you to fill me with your love, with your joy, with your peace, with your patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I need your strength inside of me today with Karen and every other person that I come in contact with. I don't trust myself, and I can't depend on people. Listen to what I just said. I don't trust myself, and I can't depend on people. When I began to turn to God and trust in him, and and what I mean by that is it has to be a relationship. It has to be real. When When I say depending on God, I'm not talking about an ethereal thing or just saying it. I'm talking about when you're hurt, when you're mad, when you're empty, when you're frustrated, when when you feel lonely, when all those things, you turn to God. You don't turn on your spouse. You don't turn to something else. You turn to God and you trust him with that need in your life. Well, I turned to God. When when my life changed, when I Mary changed, I turned to God. Let me say, our four deepest needs are acceptance, identity, security, and purpose. And acceptance means to be really loved constantly, perfectly, for who I really am and not to have to perform for it. I don't want to have to perform for it. Okay. When I began to experience God's love, I no longer felt rejected when Karen didn't give me the response I needed. And this was the most dramatic change that I saw in our relationship. I would be walking, it's true today, it's true in our relationship today, because Karen's a, a wonderful wife. But she's a person, just like me. I'm a human being. And when Karen responds to me in a certain way, and this this began to happen, as soon as I began to turn to God, and I released Karen from the expectation of being my source. And I didn't trust myself anymore because I saw what I was capable of. The meanness and the pettiness that I was capable of. And when I began to turn to God, I remember the first time that Karen made a response to me that before would have made me feel rejected. And she made this response toward me. And I remember thinking, she's having a bad day, but there's nothing wrong with me. It felt so good. Because you know what my response was? To go help her. Rather than getting my feelings hurt and sit in my jaw, like, I'll get you back. I don't care what you cook tonight, it's not good. And I can't wait to tell you. <laughs> Is this any good? Yeah. Now, you, next time you ask me if you look fat in that, you're going to get it, sister. I go, well, I don't know. Yeah. It feels so good not to depend on people. It feels so good. It feels so good to be able to love a person who's not loving you with God's love. When I'm mad at Karen, when I'm upset at Karen and I go pray, God never takes my side. And I've tried to get him to do it many times. You know, I just, God strike her. Remember the Bible, you know, just, you struck people in the Bible, strike her. But when I go and pray, you know what God does? He fills me with his love for her because his love is perfect permanent and powerful. He'll never take an offense against her. He'll never reject her. He'll never stop believing in her. Ever. So if I try to get her to meet that need, it's so, if I try to meet my need myself, I know, I've seen what I can do. But every time I turn to God, he fills me with a supernatural, perfect love for Karen and we've been married 40 years, and I love that sister. And I'm going to be married to her for the rest of my life because of God. You can clap. Go ahead. And I know good and well that a lot of you have had your heart broken, and I'm like, like me. You've had your heart broken. You've been through difficult relationship after difficult relationship. And for some of you, as I'm sitting here talking, there's a light bulb that came on and said, i just been trusting in people. Hey, this is Brent Evans with Exo Marriage, and I want to thank you for listening to the Marriage Today podcast. 
We believe your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you do it God's way. If you enjoyed today's teaching and want to keep learning, hey, subscribe to the Marriage Today podcast and take some time to leave us a review. Your reviews help us spread the word and can encourage someone else in need. For more great marriage content, check out exomarriage.com where you can see all of our marriage building resources, articles, and live events.